The mention of the name Roadrunner may bring several things to your mind. At any rate, we're going to talk about it today on The Lutheran Ambassador. The Lutheran Ambassador, the voice of the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations and the Free Lutheran Churches in your area. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And today the Holy Spirit, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, seeks to set men and women free. And when the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. What is the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations? Well, first of all, as our name states, we're an association, a group of congregations that have banded together into an association, a fellowship of churches. The purpose? To proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and to proclaim that truth to His Word, the Bible. Association free. We're free of any higher affiliation than the congregation. We're Lutheran, adhering to the historic Lutheran creeds based on the Word of God. And we're congregational in approach. The congregation is the right form of the kingdom of God on earth and recognizes no synod or higher authority over the congregation. If you'd like more information on the emphasis and the gospel preaching of the AFLC, we invite you to contact the Free Lutheran Church in your area. By the way, his address and the pastor will be given at the end of this broadcast. The message today on the Lutheran Ambassador is given by Pastor Herbert Franz. He speaks to us today on the subject, The Roadrunner. In 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, the last part of verse 24, it says, So run that you may obtain. So run that you may obtain. Athletic figures abound in the letters of the Apostle Paul. 
And New Testament scholars tell us that they show Paul's familiarity with the ancient Greek and Roman athletic contests. You will note that Paul speaks about running in our text. And then in verses 26 and 27 of 1 Corinthians 9, he speaks about boxing. He says, So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. And then you will note if you go into Ephesians, the sixth chapter, he speaks about wrestling. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers of darkness. Now, Paul may have played in athletic events as a youth, but it is extremely doubtful that he had much contact with the organized Roman games. You see, as a Pharisee and later as a Christian, he could hardly participate in the heathen festivals which were a part of the Roman games with a very good conscience. Now, there were religious overtones, however, to the Roman games. Uh, They were instituted in the name and for the honor of pagan gods. The amphitheaters or sports palaces were lined with idols, and religious processions were always held in conjunction Uh, with these sporting events and sacrifices were also offered by the representatives of the state and also by those who won the victory. Now, as uh, years passed by, the Roman games became even more vicious and more degenerate. Uh, Innocent sports such as racing and wrestling uh, gave way to fights with wild beasts. Paul said he, he fought with beasts in Ephesus. We read that in 1 Corinthians 15. And gladiators were forced to struggle to their death. Uh, Indescribably ferocious and lustful spectacles were sponsored, we are told, by the bloodthirsty emperors who ruled in those days. And hundreds of, of Christian martyrs lost their lives in the Colosseum, and their blood stained the sand of the arena floor. Some said if you wanted to get a relic of those days, all you had to do was to pick up a handful of sand from the arena floor, and you had the blood of some Christian martyr. Now, Paul may not have been an avid sports fan for fear of compromise with the religious forces of evil or for the association that he would have with bad company. However, it is clear that Paul admired athletics, And he alluded to them in figurative speech so that he might convey a spiritual message to the people of his day. Now, in our day, or in our text, Paul likens the Christian life to an athlete running in a race. And he encourages each would-be follower of Jesus Christ to run the race that they might obtain the incorruptible crown that fades not away. Uh, Paul is always encouraging the Christian to finish the course. He's always encouraging the Christian to endure the hardships of running the race. Always keeping your eyes, he said, upon Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. Now, of course, before we can get into the race, we have to sign up. Real Christianity begins with joining the team. And the team is headed by the captain of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. We read this in Hebrews, the second chapter, verse 10. Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation. And the call comes to each one of us to join the team. How many times this word come is used in Scripture? Come for all things are now ready. And the last command in God's word in the book of Revelation, in the last chapter we read, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Jesus said, come unto me and I will give you rest. And this call is very personal. It has your name on it. We just insert our name in the whosoever wills of of God's word. 
He doesn't come out and say, well, Herb, you accept Jesus. But he says, whosoever will may come. And certainly we can answer yes or no. God doesn't force himself upon any of us to join the team. It's the Holy Spirit's task to convict us of sin. He lets us know what we are in ourselves. And then he lets us know the defeats we will suffer running our own race. And he lets us know what the goal would be in the end and the life after death. And then he shows us his team. And he shows us the goal. And he shows us what we can experience right in this life and then in the future life. And so he presents these claims to us. And then he asks us to decide. But how often he asks us, first of all, before we join the team, you count the cost of discipleship. He doesn't want anyone to join and then quit. You know, I have read a very interesting article by William McDonald. He writes many tracts, and, and, and his article was entitled Evangelical Dilemma today. He said, there is a curious problem today in the evangelical world one that poses sobering questions for the church and for the individual believer. The problem, in brief, is this. A great army of personal soul winners has been mobilized to reach the populace for Christ. They are earnest, they are zealous, they are enthusiastic, they are persuasive. And to their credit, it must be said that they are on the job. And it is one of the phenomena of our times that they rack up an astounding number of conversions. Everything so far seems to be on the plus side. But he says the problem is this. The conversions do not stick. The fruit does not remain. Six months later, there is nothing to be seen for all of the aggressive evangelism. The capsule technique of the four laws of soul winning has produced stillbirth. And how true this is. And he said, the thing that is missing are two things he should say. First of all, there is no real repentance of sin. This is wrong with much of the soul winning today. He said, if all of the people who were converted in the huge evangelistic campaigns that all of our big evangelists have were living for Christ, this country of ours would be the most Christian country in the world. We read in every campaign of Graham of 10, 12, 15,000 converts. But where are they six months after? This is the question that William McDonald raises. He said he believes there has to be a sowing of the seed first. Oh, he believes in instantaneous conversion where a person comes in and perhaps hears the word of God for the first time. But he said, these are isolated experiences. The Holy Spirit of God has to work that seed into the heart and bring about new birth. And he said, one of the reasons, too, why evangelical Christianity is in the state it is in today is because... The average person who comes to faith in Christ is never told to count the cost of running the race. Count the cost of discipleship. Don't begin the race if you don't aim to finish. For people will say, he began, but he couldn't finish. He began to build and left the house half built. And he said, people, will go by and say, ha, 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 some fellow, he never counted the cost before he started to build. Jesus asks, son, give me thine heart. Whoso forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. Now, I believe the day is coming in the closing days of this dispensation of grace when nominal church members are going to be compelled to take a stand with Christ and his church or against him. 
For persecution may strike the out-and-out Christian, which is sold out to the cause of Christ by organized religion. Did you read the article, Must Our Churches Finance Revolution by Clarence W. Hall in the October issue of Reader's Digest, 1971? The caption over the article reads, Preaching the Gospel of Racial Justice, the World Council of Churches is using church power and church funds to back insurrection in the United States and Africa. And then he asks, is this what Christ taught? Must our churches finance revolution? You get a copy of that and read that. Yes, persecution may come to the Christian church sold out to the soul-saving gospel of Christ by organized religion headed by the WCC before Christ comes back. Uh, organized churches have, have tried to silence Richard Wormbrand for years. Yes, the day may come like it was in Romania that if you don't go along with the tide of organized religion, the kind that the World Council of Churches advocates, you will be compelled to suffer for your faith. Uh, we must remember that the religion of the days preceding Christ's return will be the lukewarm kind as depicted in the religious life of the church at Laodicea. But we also know that this kind of religion made Jesus sick. He had to spew this kind of church out of his mouth. The living church was caught up, but organized religion was spewed out of his mouth. He couldn't stand it. And the day may come when Christians who stand up for the Bible doctrine of salvation through faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Bible doctrine of separation that has even the appearance of evil will suffer persecution. You can read what men of God have had to go through in days gone by and even today for standing up for Christ. I can't agree with everything what Dr. Carl McIntyre does because he is way out on, on, on one side. And yet, we speak about freedom of the press in our country. And you know that his college out there in Collingswood, Shelton College, was closed down. They come out with some flimsy reasons for the closing of it. Then the radio station that he has out there in New Jersey never, uh, could not get a renewed license. Why is it? Because he speaks out against the WCC and against communism. Freedom of the press? Is that what we have? Just think of what Wormbrandt has gone through. Just recently, he was in one of our Midwestern cities. I just got a letter from one of our association pastors. And this fellow was forbidden, Wormbrandt was forbidden to appear on the radio when he had made contacts with the radio station months in advance, and when he came there, pressure had been exerted upon the radio to keep him off. And when he called one of our Lutheran pastors, who doesn't belong to our association, to pray, to pray for the Christians in communist prison camps, this pastor cut him off. Now, I believe that if the nominal church member had to renounce his faith or go to prison for his faith, I believe that a vast majority would find out that they had no faith to renounce. Wormbrandt was persecuted in Romania along with his wife for defending the gospel of Jesus Christ as outlined in Holy Scripture. The other church leaders in Romania appeared on television and they went along with the communists, speaking out freely that everything was all right, that there was liberty, that communism was all right. And Mrs. Wormbrandt, sitting there at this big attraction, listening to these wolves in sheep's clothing, selling out the gospel to the godless ideology of communism, whispered to her husband, are you going to allow these men of the cloth to spit in the face of Jesus Christ? And Wormbrandt knew that if he spoke out against anything these churchmen said, he would either die or go to prison. And he said this to his wife. You know what she said? 
I would rather have a dead Christian husband than a coward who would spit in the face of Jesus Christ. And Wormbrand stood up when his turn came to speak on television, and he denounced communism and these other men of the church. And he confessed his faith in Jesus Christ. And as a result, he and his wife were thrown into prison, and they were separated from their nine-year-old boy. How would you like that? And the boy had to try to rear himself. No one was allowed to give food or anything to this boy without the threat of punishment. But God provided for this nine-year-old son that Christians smuggled food to him every day. And at the age of 11, he was allowed to see his mother for the first time since her imprisonment. Two years had gone by, mind you, since she saw him. What a tremendous experience this was. And she was just anticipating in her own mind how much he had grown and how he looked and, and so on. What would she say? How would she act? Can't you see this scene? And the boy was brought to the prison fence. She was on one side of the prison fence and the boy on the other, on the other, on the other side. And she looked at him. And he looked at her. And two guards stood by the mother. And the mother cried out to her son just three words. Believe on Jesus Christ. When she said these words, the communist guards pulled her away from her son. But do you know what happened? That 11-year-old boy was converted on the spot. Oh, yes. It costs something to run the race. It means persecution. It means suffering. It means sweat. It means tears. It means hardship. It means going without things. It means to be called all kinds of names. If you're an out-and-out -out Christian, if you stand up for what you believe, and only those who surrender all their hearts to Jesus Christ will be there at the finish. God is looking for real soldiers of the cross, not parade ground soldiers. Not those guys that go on sick call every time a task comes. Only those truly surrendered to Christ will finish the race. And when we join the Lord's team, we must make up our minds to be a winner. That we are going to finish, that we are going to go through any discipline that is needed for us to finish the race. And remember this, battles won tomorrow are prepared for today. The whole Bible and all past history unite to teach that battles are always won before the armies take the field. And the critical moment for any army is not the day it engages the foe in actual combat. It is the day before or the month before or the year before. And the critical time for a singer is not the tense moment when he or she steps out to face a waiting audience. If the song has not been a success before that time, it will be no success then. And every musical triumph is a result of years of discipline and practice and hard work. And let a young singer imagine he can skip the tough preparation and he will soon be forgotten. He may get by for a little while on enthusiasm and personality and good looks, but the lack of foundation work will tell before long and the public will pass him by for someone who is willing to pay the price it costs to win. It did not take Moses long to lead the children of Israel through the Red Sea to deliverance and freedom, but his fittedness to lead them was a result of years of hard discipline. It took David only a few minutes to dispose of Goliath, but he had already beaten the giant in the person of the lion and the bear. Christ stood silent in the presence of Pilate and for our sake went calmly out to die. He could endure the anguish of the cross because he had already suffered the pains of Gethsemane the night before and there was a direct relationship between these two experiences of Christ. Lot fled from Sodom 
with the tattered remnant of his family and left all his property behind to perish in the flames. But his loss did not occur the night he escaped the burning city. His loss occurred the day he lifted up his eyes and saw all of the well-watered plains of Jordan and coveted them. Preparation is vital. And we need to live in the Word every day. We need to live in prayer every day if we are going to finish the race. And we must keep our eyes upon Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It's John Rice who says that in Hebrews the 12th chapter, verse 1, about the company who, would, who encompasses it about, are the Christians in glory sitting in heaven's grandstand encouraging us to run the race and to get rid of every weight that would trip us up. And the second one to encourage us is the Lord Jesus Christ. We keep our eyes upon him. Would you like to say at the end of life, as Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. You see, Paul never flinched when the going was tough, for he knew that all those who live godly shall suffer persecution from the ungodly world. But Paul looked unto Jesus at all times, and he could also claim this, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord the righteous judge shall give to me, and not to me only, but unto all those that love his appearing. Never take your eyes off the goal, the Lord Jesus. Read about the 26-mile marathon race. A man from England became very tired. He took his eyes off the finish line, and he thought he had crossed it, but he missed the finish line by 15 yards. A man from Scotland came in 15 minutes later, but crossed the last tape and won. So near, but yet so far because his eyes were off the goal. Let us keep our eyes upon Jesus, so run that you might obtain. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we pray that there might be many starters, and as many starters as there are, there will be that many finishers, that those that start will finish the race and claim the incorruptible crown that fades not away. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You have just heard the Lutheran Ambassador. Our speaker today, Pastor Herbert Franz, speaking on the subject, The Roadrunner. Stay tuned to the close of this broadcast for a word of announcement from the Free Lutheran Church in your area. And join us next week at the same time for another broadcast of The Lutheran Ambassador. Your announcer is Wayne Peterson. Mm -hmm.